I've gotten older, like the announcements and stuff, I just print really, really large, and then my sermon notes I print really, really large, but for some reason the, the lettering in my Bible has, has getting smaller and smaller, and what I... I remember when I was younger, I used to pride myself thinking I could just read, like in the doctor's visits, right? They're like, read this one line, and I would read it, and, and just for fun, I would read the one below it, right? Now, I'm like, I can barely read it, and then when they put it up really close, I'm like, whoa, that's way too close. And, um, and I've noticed the last few Sundays I've had to kind of push my Bible aside, so I'm leaning on my reading glasses, so isn't it fun getting old? or getting older, right? Psalm chapter 137, this is what it says, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion, on the willows there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required us of songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem, how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we give thanks? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we thank you that during this whole series we, we are invited into your presence. Lord, to share what is on our hearts, to lay our soul bare before you in the rawness of our emotions. Lord, we thank you, God, for, for that, that permission that you have given us to come before you with, with humility and honesty. That, Lord, you hear our hearts cry. Lord, as we look at this psalm this morning, I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts. And that, Lord, we would draw from it, uh, from, the, from, it, from it what we need in our lives and, and that we could apply its truth to our situation so that we may reflect your glory. For those around us. Lord God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing our series in the book of Psalms. Next week, we're going to wrap it up in Psalms chapter 22. Uh, how fitting to wrap up our series on Psalms with, on, uh, good, on Palm Sunday with looking at Psalm 22. Psalm 22 uh, is a, uh, a psalm that is just laden with uh, messianic overturns and how we see Christ in that. Uh, but we've looked over the different types of psalms in this series. The first one is really that preface that really sets the tone, the tension between the righteous and how they're to be blessed and the wicked and how that the way of the wicked is, it leads to destruction. But yet we live in a world where that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. It seems that the righteous are the ones that are suffering and the wicked are the ones that are succeeding. Uh, we also looked in the second week uh, Psalm 115, that this was a psalm that declared God's glory and honor and how that we are called in our prayer life to declare God's honor. And when we come together as a corporate body, that we as a body of believers come to him and declare his glory and his honor and that he is worthy of all of our praise and all of our worship. And the third week, we looked at a psalm of lament and, and, and sadness. Uh, this was when David was hiding from King Saul, and he was taking refuge in a cave, and, and he just felt abandoned, and he felt all alone, and that it's okay for us to feel like we're all alone, and to go before the Lord in his presence, and to, to share that, to, to share what we're feeling, and know that he, and he alone, is our refuge. Although it may seem that everyone's abandoned us, we know that God hasn't abandoned us, that we can take refuge in him. Last week we learned that when we give thanks to the Lord for the things that he's already done, uh, as we looked at the psalm last week, uh, I love the Lord because, and we begin to list the things that he has done for us and the reason why we love him, it builds faith within us for our current situation that we may be facing. And it strengthens us for tomorrow and the challenges that we may be facing in the near future. So as we look back and give praise to God 
for the faith for his faithfulness and the things that he's done in the past it allows us to walk in the peace of god for today and this week we're looking at psalm 137 and this is a psalm that calls for justice over evil uh, i've said this throughout this series and say it again God desires for us to be completely honest before him. This psalm really causes a lot of discomfort uh, uh, in, in among Christians because of verse 9, right? Blessed shall he who takes your little ones and dashes them on the rocks. It's like, that seems gruesome and violent. And yet here it is. And this is a, the heartfelt cry of the writer of this psalm, that, that he is crying out for justice. As the children of God, we can be honest with him about what is going on. We can be honest with him about our hatred for evil and the injustice that we see all around us while we're pursuing justice in light of God's mercy and his sovereignty. And that, we're not talking about social justice. We're talking about biblical justice that we are to pursue. This psalm is classified as an imprecatory psalm. And these types of psalms is a psalm of lament, but they cry out for justice against one's enemies. Usually, as we see in verse 9 that I just read again, in a violent way. It's asking God to break the jaw of his enemies. It's asking God to crush his enemies. And, and in this sense, he's asking God to do to them, to the Babylonians, what the Babylonians had done to them. He's asking for justice. While most psalms are peaceable, these imprecatory psalms reveal the desire for justice against our enemies as well as evil itself. And this psalm describes the fruit of exile. A little background of this psalm with what's going on. Uh, because of the children of Israel, the children of Judah had sinned and rebelled against God, the ten northern tribes of Israel had long since been in captivity and dispersed. Uh, it wasn't until later on that the kingdom of Judah uh, was also taken into exile and Jerusalem was ransacked. And this is the fruit of the exile. Uh, they are now a far away from their homeland. Uh, Jerusalem had been uh, ransacked. The temple had been stripped of all of its gold. Uh, those that were left behind weren't in any better shape than those that were taken into exile. Uh, so we see the devastation that this is causing them, but it's also a picture of what it looks like to be exiled from God. When we are not in right relationship with God, there is a, there is a, a, a tearing away, a barrenness of our soul because we're not in right relationship with God. And, and as bad as the exile was physically, their spiritual exile was even worse. And we see that even in, in our natural realm, right? Uh, the physical consequences of sin can be severe, but they pale in comparison to the spiritual consequences of sin. Even back all the way in the Garden of Eden, their physical act of disobeying God and the consequences of that being removed from the garden and thistles and thorns growing up was bad. But what was worse was the spiritual repercussions of their sin. Now they were cut off from God. And here we see the same picture, that their exile was really a picture of their relationship with God, that they had been cut off from God. This psalm divides into two parts. First, we are given a picture of the condition of the exiles, right? They are drawn so evidently and, and, and so vividly that many commentators believe that the writer of this psalm uh, faced the exile firsthand. Uh, that it wasn't just past generations looking back upon the stories that were told to them, but this was uh, in such detail and such vividness that, and, and you hear the heart's cry of the writer of this psalm, that most likely many commentators believe that it was written by the exile himself, that he experienced it firsthand. And so the writer lays bare his, his feelings, right, of his own heart. And then we see uh, his, uh, his call for justice and his devotion to God. Uh, the two feelings are his intense love for Jerusalem and his intense hatred for his oppressors, right? He loves Jerusalem. He's thinking back, and yet that what he's experiencing causes him to hate the oppression uh, of what he's experienced. So let's look at this psalm a little closer. Verse 1, we are given the memory of what has been lost. 
Even the title of the psalm says, How shall we sing the songs of the Lord? That's the title of the psalm. So you already get the, the tone of where this psalm is going just by the title, right? How shall we sing the songs of the Lord? And then he goes in verse 1, and he says, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat, and we wept when we remembered Zion. Have you ever lost a job? Maybe it was a good job, and it was taken. Maybe you laid off, and you sit back, and you think, man, that was, that was awful. Or maybe you look back, and you think, look at all the good old days of what used to be. Life was much simpler back then, and, and you, you feel kind of blue and a little down. This was that, but much more. They're looking back at what they lost. What is the saying? You don't know what you have until you lose it, right? And this is where they're finding themselves. Everything that they had taken for granted. Understand that they never thought that Jerusalem would fall to the, to, to the enemies, right? That God would not allow his holy city, where his temple dwelt, where he lived, to fall to the Gentiles and to be ransacked. And so this was a splash of cold water in their face when God allowed the Babylonians to come in and to ransack Jerusalem and to destroy the temple and then to take the people into exile. Now they're in a foreign land and in a foreign place with language that wasn't their own and customs that were all different. And they're sitting by the waters of Babylon. These are not just the rivers, but they're the canal system and, and maybe the break in their work day. And they're sitting by the, the, the water and they're remembering all that they had lost. They're remembering the beauty of the temple, the grandeur of the city. They saw with their eyes the destruction. And now they're sitting remembering what they lost and they begin to weep. You read in this one verse the sadness and the hopelessness and the despair that they were experiencing. Again, when you, uh, people would go into exile, you never returned. That was really the final straw. If you, if you kept being rebellious, if you kept not doing what the, 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 the stronger empire wanted you to do, eventually they would displace you so that you would have nothing to fight for. We see that even in our own news, right? The reason why the Ukrainians are fighting so fiercely is because they're fighting for their homeland. Whereas the Russian army isn't fighting as strong. Why? Because it's not their homeland, right? So when you displace the people, they have nothing to fight for now. And they're broken. And this is where we pick up with the captives in exile. They are a broken people. They lost all that they had held on to. And they're remembering They've been removed from their land, everything that they were accustomed to, and they were thrust into a culture that was so contrast to what they were known for, and they began to weep. Now, this isn't just a, you know, feeling blue, like, oh, you know, remember the good old days? You know, remember back when you used to do, it wasn't that, it wasn't reminiscing, it was sadness, it was a brokenness of spirit and of heart, and they began to weep, and this word really means to sob, to wail. They were crying out when they remembered all that they had lost. This is my version. They bawled their eyes out, right? They literally was weeping and crying and so distraught and broken when they, re when they realized all that they had lost. In verse 2 and 4, we see that music, mirth, and songs were now impossible, right? They, they couldn't sing. There was no joy in their heart. We see the cruel taunts from their Babylonian oppressors who wanted to hear the happy songs in a time of grief, right? They were, they were putting insult to injury, putting salt in the wounds, if you will, by telling them, sing the songs of the Lord, sing these joyous songs. And, and the writer saying, how can we do this? How can we sing when we've lost so much, when we're being oppressed? The writer goes on and describes the Israelites' refusal to participate, asking in verse 4, how can we sing the, long, the Lord's song in a foreign land? When everything that has been taken from us, you destroyed our temple, you destroyed our city, we're now in, we're a captive in exile from our homeland. How can we sing the songs of the Lord? How can we pretend to be okay when nothing is okay? 
the writer is really asking the Babylonian oppressors, how can we see under such conditions? These verses summarize the message of Psalm 137, and it's this. We must be authentic before God, before others, and even before ourselves. We can, we can sing songs of honesty and truth, even if it's full of pain and hatred of evil. The writer's response was real simple. He says, we can't and we won't fake it. They were wanting them to, you know, kind of cheer up, guys, you know, that let's, let's, you know, you're bringing everybody down. And yet their response was, we can't and we won't. We won't fake it. We don't have the joy in us to sing the song of the Lord so we're not going to. And what does that teach us? That when we come before the presence of God and things aren't okay, don't act like they're okay when they're not okay. Faith isn't saying reality doesn't exist. And then sometimes we think that if we're godly, if we're walking by faith, that somehow that means we deny the reality of what's going on around us. That's not faith, right? That's denial. Uh, that's, that, 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 that's not healthy. That's not normal. That's not good. Faith declares what is real, the reality of what I'm going through, but it looks and it constantly focuses our attention upon God. And when we come before him with a heavy heart, it's okay to come before him with a heavy heart. It's okay to be authentic and real before the Lord. What he doesn't want is us to fake it. He doesn't want us to put on a smiley face and be like, hey, everything is good when everything is not good. And this is what the writer is saying. I can't fake it. We're not going to fake it. We, we've lost our joy. And so we're going to sit here under the tree by the waters, and we're going to weep as we remember everything that we've lost. That's encouragement for you and I, because there's going to be times when we feel like we've lost, or we've lost everything. And it's okay to come before the presence of God and to sit before Him and to weep when we realize the things that we've lost. Verse 5 and 6, we see the writer's passionate devotion. This, this torment from the oppressors almost began to swell up within him, uh, this passionate devotion. Yes, they lost everything, but what does the writer say? He, he's literally expressing his devotion and vows to never forget Jerusalem. He literally states that if he doesn't remember Jerusalem, let his right hand become crippled. And, and again, what he's speaking is most people are right-handed. It was a, The right hand represents strength. And, and to have a crippled right hand means that you can't do stuff. And he's saying, let it be, be done to me that if I don't remember Jerusalem, let me be crippled. Let me forget how my hand uses or my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. We also have to understand this, that he's not just speaking about Jerusalem, the geographic city. He's speaking about Jerusalem and Mount Zion and all that it represents. Jerusalem and Zion represented the, the place of God where God dwelt. It represented God's presence because Jerusalem was God's holy city. Why? Because his temple where God lived among his people was, right? That's where the sacrifices, that's where they would meet and commune with God. So Jerusalem and Zion represented the presence of God. And what he is really saying isn't about just forgetting a geographic city. I'm, you know, I'm not going to forget my, home, my, my hometown. What he's saying is, is I'm not going to forget the presence of God. <clears throat> Although he lost his joy, things were taken from him. Now he doesn't have access to the presence of God through the temple at Jerusalem. He was declaring that he wasn't going to forget God. He wasn't going to forget God's presence, even though he was sitting in exile. He vows to remember and to place Jerusalem as his highest joy. What he's saying is, is although what I'm going through at the present time is difficult and it creates great distress within me and they're weeping as they remember what was lost he said that the presence of God will still be my highest joy and in verse 7 and 9 we see the writer's burning hatred towards his oppressors the writer desires what happened to Jerusalem to happen to his enemies have you ever felt that way 
Somebody who was mean to you, somebody maybe they talked bad about you, they stabbed you in the back, they betrayed you. Our first, our first reaction is, oh, I hope they get what they did to me. This is what the writer is saying. What he's saying is, is, you know, Lord, they did this to us. We pray that you would repay them. The writer, at the end of it all, is really crying out for justice. They had killed and mutilated people and destroyed the city. And what they're asking for is justice. Right? We ought to pray for justice to be provided wherever we see oppression. You see, at the heart of this psalm is God is crying out to God for justice. That they had been mistreated. It wasn't just a, that they had lost a battle and was taken into captivity, but they were humiliated. And there were many atrocities that were done against the people of Israel as they were being taken into exile. And the writer is asking God to rise up and to pay them back for what they had done. Now, as Christians, when we read songs like this, it does cause us a little uh, uneasiness. And that's good. Let, I hope you feel uneasy. Don't, don't. I read different commentators, and, and I was a little disappointed with the, they, they tried to sugarcoat and, and kind of sand the rough edges. No, there's a reason why God allowed this psalm to remain in the scriptures, and it's to get us to feel uneasy. It's to make us feel like, wait a minute, dude, bless Jahi who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. That seems so gruesome. And it does make us feel uneasy, and that's good. We ought to pray for justice. We ought to pray that whenever we see oppression within our country, around the world, that God would rise up. But as believers, we don't just read verse 9 in isolation. We don't read chapter 137 in the book of Psalms in isolation, right? You get into trouble when you cherry pick scriptures, when you just take one scripture and you just focus a whole theology around one verse or one chapter. We read the scriptures within the scripture of uh, the context of the scripture. So we read chapter 137 in light of the whole scripture. And as believers, we look at 137 in light of the New Testament as well. We read this in light of the Gospels. We understand that we truly have only one enemy. The Babylonians aren't our enemy. The Russians aren't our enemy. As believers, the LGBTQ are not our enemy. Are you with me this morning? They're not our enemy. Those that are, are, are advocating for the murder of babies and through abortion, they're not our enemy. We understand as believers, we have only one enemy. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. So we read this verse 9, and we read this whole chapter 137, in light of Ephesians 6, 12, that we recognize that our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is spiritual, and this is where we make our request to God. This is where we fight the fight, the holy fight that he's called us to in the spiritual realm. We understand that, that everything that happens in the natural realm is really a reflection of what's going on in the spirit realm. And so if we want to change our natural realm, then we must wage war in the spiritual realm. This is where we pull down the strongholds, where we take charge and we advance the kingdom of God through prayer against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against those spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And we call them to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. If you don't like your natural realm situation, then you got to make war in the heavenly realm. You, you pray in the heavenly realm. You pray and you pull those strongholds down, and then the natural realm will begin to reflect what's going on in the spiritual realm. And this is what he's praying. He's asking God for justice against the oppression. And as believers, we learn from this, that when we see oppression, that we pray and that we seek God and we pull down those strongholds. The, the prayer of a righteous person 
is powerful, James tells us. And he gives us an example of Elijah who prayed every day for three years that there wouldn't be rain. One man's prayer kept the rain away for three years. And Elijah was a man, a person, just like you and me. He wasn't some superhuman, had some special favor with God where God would listen to his prayers, but not your prayers. If Elijah could do that through prayer, what can you do to bringing down strongholds, to pushing back oppression and bringing justice where there is injustice? As we close, we should pray the imprecatory prayers and psalms with the mindset that the real enemy is a spiritual one. You see, the devil would love nothing more for us to think that your neighbor, the person down the street, this political person or, or that activist group, that they are your enemy. And to have you fight them, it would make the devil nothing, it would nothing make it better or happier than to see us wage this war that we're called to fight in the spiritual realm to wage that war in the natural realm. So we are to pray these type of prayers with the mindset that our real enemy is a spiritual one. That it reminds us they're not our enemy. Right? There are people that, you know, political figures, they can just, I mean, can make your blood boil. They're not the enemy. There's people espousing all types of perversion and all types of, of sinfulness. They're not the enemy. And you have to look past them to the spiritual realm. And understand that that's where the battle is. And these imprecatory psalms remind us that we're to pray for biblical justice to occur. And it reminds us that we do have an enemy that is actively fighting against us. It is always right to agree with God in praying that justice will prevail. And that God obliterates his enemies. The enemy, the devil. Who is at work behind all the manifestations of evil in our world. Understand this, when you see the evils that are happening around the world and the atrocities that are occurring, there is one entity behind all of that, and it's the devil. Last night, man, I were watching uh, Dateline, and there was two girls, back in 1986, they were 11 years old, and it just dawned me, I was 11 years old in 1986. They were my age, brutally murdered. For years, they couldn't find who it was. They thought it was one person that ended up being two people. They finally caught them. But I thought, how many birthdays? I mean, they were my age. I mean, how much life did I live from that point to now that was taken from them, and yet justice would not let it go? In fact, it was a girl in that hometown, this is about the same age, who grew up, became a detective, and was put on the force, and she was compelled to that case, and just wouldn't let her go. Why? Because justice. These are older men now, finally coming to justice. The one of the mothers, I don't know how her faith was shown through there. She was talking about how evil. It wasn't the men, but it was the devil behind it. Understanding that even the, 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 what had happened to her daughter, the real enemy, the real culprit behind such evilness is the devil. May we never forget that people are not our enemy. The devil's our enemy. And he set a bullseye on each one of us. And he doesn't care how he goes about it, but he wants to wreak havoc in your life. And we see in a world where he's wreaked havoc in a lot of people's lives. And so this is an encouragement for us to fight, to take up our weapons that God has given us, that are mighty, as Paul says, to the pulling down of strongholds, so that we can begin to see the change in our culture and in our world that needs to take place. And we can cry out to God for justice, and he will hear. Amen? Would you join me in prayer? Father, Lord, we just pause in our message, in our sermon, in our service. And Lord, we recognize that there are a lot of injustices in our world today. There's a lot of atrocities that are occurring. A lot of them, Lord, aren't on the local news station. They're not being reported. They're, they're happening all around the world, and the world is silent to it. 
O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who loves justice and extends mercy to the oppressed. God, we pray for them. And we pray, God, that you would execute justice. And that, Lord, you would show mercy upon those who are being oppressed. Lord, we pray that you would fight for them. Lord, we understand that we have one enemy. And, Lord, we pray that you would bind him up. And, God, we pray that, that, that justice would flow. Lord, we pray that you would convict those that are agents of injustice. Convict them, O oh God. Bring about repentance in their heart. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, we also pray for us here in this room that, Lord, we would be agents of justice. Lord, that when we see oppression taking place, whether it's here locally or we see it on the news, that, Lord, we would immediately get on our face before you and intercede for those situations. And that, Lord, we would, we would make war in the heavenly realms. Lord, may we not just turn the channel. May we not just turn our face and turn our ear and close it to, to what we see around us. But, Lord, may we be used by you as agents of your mercy and of justice. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen and amen.